those of you who are joining us not live, you know, we have Dr. Paolo Selba from the Weinberg Cerebral Palsy um, Family uh, Centre here with us um, from Columbia University, who is an orthopaedic surgeon and absolutely an expert in gait analysis. So we're going to dive straight in and talk about how gait analysis is used and why it's such an important tool uh, for orthopaedic surgeons uh, to use when they're thinking about surgery. Well, I think gait analysis is crucial uh, when you're treating people uh, to make them walk better. The same way when you have anemia and you have to have a blood test to see what's wrong with your blood, when you have a problem with gait, the best way to examine gait is through uh, three-dimensional gait analysis. And what it does through a series of equi equipment, these are very specialized cameras and, and uh, force platforms on the floor and equipment that can measure uh, how much your muscles are active or not active during gait. And you can measure the amount of oxygen that you're being uh, using through uh, gait. You can measure the way you put pressure on your feet. So when we, when we put all this information together, it's really when we understand what's, what's wrong or not wrong, but what, what are the mechanisms that the patients are using to cope sure. with the issues that they cannot do properly in gait? So that's, that's when we, we can really understand what, what's happening in gait. And even better than that, we can start designing uh, treatments, which are not necessarily always uh, sur surgeries, mm -hmm. but treatments. And, and, and very often with gait analysis, we decide that there is no treatment that should be done at this stage or that stage. So gait analysis is the picture of gait. When you have, uh, when you have a hip problem, you take an x-ray, when you have a problem with the way you walk, you get a gait analysis. So it's not a treatment, it's a tool that enables us to uh, understand how, how we walk. And, and it's sort of, in a way, I suppose, almost um, shows what's going on inside, uh, you know, with what's going on with your muscles, which muscles are working, which ones aren't necessarily working, um, you know, what angles is happening at your hips and your knees and your ankles when you're walking. So it's almost um, getting all that information so you can put it together to say, all right, this intervention would help, um, you know, have this outcome with your gait, particularly, if, you know, whatever your goals might be. But I just wanted to also touch on something, you know, when we're talking about gait analysis, is gait analysis as simple? Like if I'm going to my doctor, can I just get them to do gait analysis? Is it, is it just a video? Like what does gait analysis look like from like the technical aspect? Yes, uh, there, there are different levels of gait analysis as much as there are different blood tests that you can request. Mm -hmm. So very often what people use is uh, uh, bidimensional gait analysis where they have one camera seeing the patient from one side and the other camera seeing the patient from the front or the back. What we tend to use is what we call three-dimensional gait analysis. So in this, in this uh, model, what we have is we have special cameras all around the patient. Mm -hmm. And these, patient, these cameras can see the patients in three-dimensional. So, uh, uh, so anytime an arm or a hand, for instance, is moved in space, the cameras can trace exactly where, where those uh, parts of the patient's body are and where and where they are, but not only that. Uh, in the in this three-dimensional gait analysis, we have uh, what we call force plates on the on the on the ground, and these plates can measure how much force we are applying to the ground, and how is the ground reacting to that force. So when we add information from the moving parts with information from this very special scale, let's put it this way. We yes. can calculate the forces that go across the, uh, the, 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 the joints. And then we, on top of that, we put sensors on the skin that can measure muscle activity. So now we know how the, the, uh, the body part is moving, which muscles are active, which, are, which ones are not, and what are the stresses or the forces that are going through uh, the joint. So it's pretty... It's pretty incre incredible, and, and uh, it gives us a lot of information. And of course, 
-hmm. in cerebral palsy, uh, their main issues with gait relate to balance, control, uh, muscle spasticity, or as I call muscle stubbornness. You know, my children mm -hmm. with CP, I never call their limbs spastic. I call them uh, um, stubborn and they love that because they it gives them a sense of that they are rebel. So we have the muscles that are stubborn. We have sometimes or very often the bones that are twisted in one way or the other. And gait analysis helps us understand all of that together. Before gait analysis, people basically had a look at the patients and said, okay, that's what I think is happening. Then they did surgery and they could never measure whether the surgery had improved or not. They, all they could see was that the patients were walking differently, but not necessarily better. Uh, with sure. three-dimensional gait analysis, we can measure how they are to start with. We can uh, you know, design a plan uh, to treat and to improve them. And at, just as important, we see them later at one year, two years, five years, 10 years. In Melbourne, you know, we, pub uh, you know, we published a lot of data. Kurt Graham and Pam Thomas have been publishing a lot in that regard. So what, what are these kids 10 years down the track, 15 years down the track? Are we doing the right thing? And with gait analysis, we can measure all of those things very, very precisely. So uh, we've got a question that's coming already. Um, in relation to when can gait analysis start? So how young can gait analysis, like how young can a child be to start gait analysis? And should everybody have it? Or well, is it something that, yeah. No, no. Uh, first of all, I'll emphasize again that gait analysis is not treatment. Gait analysis is an exam, okay? A tool, a scan mm -hmm. of the way you walk. When should we do it? Well, when we, for the first time, when we have doubts about what the child is doing and which is the best treatment possible, is this to, uh, is, if this child is on botulinum toxin regime, is it time to stop? Is it not? Is it time to move mm -hmm. on? Could, uh, is this a, a good candidate, for instance, for selective dorsal rhizotomy? Or is this patient a good candidate for orthopedics or both? Which one comes first? So normally we, uh, we need to have a child that cooperates because the, the exam goes on yeah. for two or three hours at times. It's very boring for them. It's very tiring at times. And of course, you, you, uh, the only uh, person uh, that I know that has, collected, has been able to collect data uh, at young ages was Dr. David Sutherland. But he was an mm -hmm. angel. He could do wonderful things. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, now, nowadays, I think we, we tend to start thinking about gait analysis if we are in doubt about what comes next. At around the age of six or seven, I'd say. So, uh, some kids can, are, are able to, to do it at the age of five. I suspect that six years of age is a good time. But remember, we need to have a question. Do we have, we need to, what we do is we ask gait analysis, should I do this? Is this bone too twisted? Is this muscle too tight? Can we just get by with what we're doing right now? So very often the doctor, the orthopedic surgeon or the rehab physician or the, the physical therapist, they can do that. They don't need gait analysis. It's when we start thinking about more complex interventions like uh, selective thorsal rhizotomy and uh, multilevel surgeries that we should use uh, gait analysis. And... And I think that's a really good point to make out. So gait analysis isn't really a surveillance tool, for example. It's not something that a child, once they start walking at two, you would go get gait analysis every year. It, it is really no, one no. of those tools to, to look at when you're looking at a potentially more invasive type intervention. Um, yes. Or, well, uh, having said that, uh, in, in, in Australia, because... You know, they have the uh, beautiful medical system and uh, they have more accessibility to gait analysis. Often in Melbourne and in Sydney, if we, we had a, a child at the age of seven or eight, for instance, mm -hmm. and we weren't sure whether that child was ready for uh, this or that intervention, we would send them to the, to gait, to the gait lab. And to the, the gait lab is, is like getting a lot of opinions, uh, of opinions together because... Once we collect the data, then we sit down together and we discuss the data together. Usually 
you know, the orthopedic surgeons, the rehab physicians, the physical therapists who have been dealing with gait analysis and CP for many, many years. And then at times we'd say, look, this child is too young. Those muscles are not all that tight. Those bones are not all that twist. Let's, let's see this kid again, perhaps in two or three years. So we did a little bit of surveillance, but it's not, it's not that you just go and get gait analysis yeah, but you every still year have to, the why, to see what's going on. Yeah, you, you still have the why, though. You still, are, you still have that question that you're taking uh, to, I suppose, gait analysis to go, all right, what should we be doing here? If, we, if we're not quite sure, these are the answers yes. that we're looking for. The other sort yes. of question um, that I had for you, you know, obviously 3D gait analysis isn't available all over the country. You know, it, it is something that um, is starting to become a little bit more available here in the US. But, um, you know, is 2D gait analysis just as good or you know what how did as a parent for example how are they going to make those decisions you know if you're going into any yeah, orthopedic that's... surgery you know is your recommendation really that gait analysis is such an important tool that should be done i i, I think so uh, but but and that's a very very good but very tricky question because you know, uh, 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 the re one of the reasons I believe gait analysis is not so popular in the United States, and, and Dr. G Jim Gage told me one day, even though most of the technology was developed in this country, it's going to be yep. saved by the international community. What happened uh, many years ago is that a paper was published, a scientific paper was published, and this person got a few gait analysis and sent it to different centers where they did get analysis. And sure enough, in each center, everybody came up with a different solution for the problem. And this paper then bashed gait analysis, said, see, this is not worth nothing. But the same could happen if you sent uh, an x-ray of a child with a hip problem, if uh, mm -hmm. like DDH or Perthes disease, which is a very controversial disease. If you sent the same x-ray to 10 centers in, in the United States, they will come up with different, uh, ten, probably seven different solutions. The problem is not the x-ray. The, the x-ray is only showing the pathology. It's who interprets the x-ray and what do they know about that pathology that dictates the treatment. And gait analysis is the same. You, you know, what this paper proved 20 years ago was that different people saw the data differently and had different solutions for the data. But the data was only one. And, yeah. and within the last 25 years, the reliability of the data collection has improved tremendously because that was one, one of the criticisms in, in, in the years uh, past. So, I think that's uh, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think one of our battles, not only mine, but there's a lot of people in this country who are big, big uh, uh, in gate analysis. Our, our battle is to to show these, uh, uh, these uh, health insurance companies that there's now hundreds and hundreds of papers mm -hmm. showing, papers showing that if you have gait analysis, you do better than, than if you don't. Not because of, the, not of because of gait analysis, but because of the right conclusions that are drawn from, from gait analysis. Gait analysis doesn't change your future. What changes your future, in my opinion, is having someone who understands it. And I'm not trying to brag by myself here, mm -hmm. but trying uh, having someone to, uh, that understands gait and pathological gait and coping mechanisms and then base uh, treatment on, on, on that amount of understanding. And without gait analysis, you can't do it. Unfortunately, in this country and in many countries around the world, most kids with cerebral palsy are operated on based on the eye impression. And uh, yeah, I think you're, you're better after the surgery. But what we do know is that we sometimes get to these children who have been operated on without uh, knowledge of pathological gait and normal gait and, and gait analysis. Mm -hmm. And they're always better. They're always worse off. And it's even the, the saddest part is that this is not going away, unfortunately. There's still many children being operated you know, nowadays we have the, the percutaneous uh, <coughs> surgery where people put, put uh, knives through the skin and cut the muscles with no control, even though they say they have any control. 
uh, they don't uh, because we see them five, 10 years down the track when they come to us to try and rescue them. And we can't because they have no muscles left. And uh, I think that, so I, I think I, that I'm, though, hoping, I'm hoping, yeah, I was just I'm hoping you. that uh, oh. over time, we're going to change the situation. Because I think that's the whole point, right? Is that gait analysis can give the surgeon or whoever's doing that intervention, it's giving you more knowledge. So it allows you to choose um, potentially the best intervention that will help uh, that individual and that person. And, you know, you touched on it a little bit, and I think this is a really sort of fun piece to give, is that gait analysis now also has longitudinal data. So we know, yeah. um, particularly with certain interventions, what are the long-term outcomes? And I think that's really important as well, because obviously there are some interventions that almost feel like the quick fix. And they almost feel like, okay, yeah. that's going to, to lead to an improvement tomorrow but what we know though is for some of these actually 10 even 5 10 15 years down the track then you're actually worse off and so it's really important to then have uh you know gait analysis and use these tools so that what you can find out is go okay this is uh what is looking like this is almost what's happening inside your body because that's what gait analysis gives you a window almost to what's happening inside and then you can go okay, these are the best interventions or not, or don't do anything right now because what we want to do for a goal in 15 to 20 years' time is have independence, is to have, be able to do these different things long-term. So I think for, for parents who are, you know, tossing up between, you know, who to listen to because sometimes there is contradictory information, you know, having that framework put in place to go, okay, if, if would you go for another surgery without doing your blood test first. No, you wouldn't. So same sort of principles apply here, is if you're going to do these surgeries, you know, making sure that you have all the information that you can to make the right decision. Yes, and, and, and that's exactly it. Uh, I, I think if, if it's worth nothing, get an analysis at least gives you a picture of how you are today. Mm -hmm. And and in 10 years, when you've had your whatever treatment you chose, if you repeat gait analysis, gait analysis is the only way to measure what's happened in that time. Did you, sure. did you get better? Did you get worse? And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the problem, Rachel, is that unfortunately, we have longitudinal data now, we and many people, but we have never been able to compare our data to... Uh, the other side, because the other side never sends their, their people uh, to, to compare. So for 25 years now that I've been in this field, I've been inviting a lot of people around the world saying, okay, you operate this way, that's fair enough, but why don't you send your, your patients to us? We analyze it, we an analyze mm -hmm. the, the gate, we keep the data there quiet, and then in, in five years, we're going to analyze your results and our results and if, you know, if you're doing the right thing and we are doing the wrong thing, we're going to publish that and show. But of course, that, uh, that nobody has ever agreed <laughs> to do that because, yeah, there's a lot to be said here. And this is a long story. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in this area, unfortunately, and sadly. So I think, I think though, it, it comes to that other point, though, that for parents um, and even young adults, right, who are trying to make that decision to go, okay, I know I've... I, there's determined I need an intervention, you know, or, or I think I do. Um, you know, trying to judge, you know, what intervention to have. As we said, gait analysis is a wonderful tool to put in your back pocket to go, okay, this is what you're looking like. This is what the inside looks like. But then when you're going to make those intervention decisions, you know, can it be, for example, like, could you do an intervention now and you know, get that quick fix. And then in 10 years time, well, we just fix it again. Like, like, is that an option? Or do you see? No, unfortunately, no. And you can't fix it. It's not reversible. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, and I'll re uh, I will repeat the word, sadly, the, the current trend is not very good. People have reinvented the, the wheel in the in the 50s and 60s. Uh, people try to get these kids walking better by cutting everything, cutting all the muscles through the skin. And then they abandoned these techniques because they knew it was a catastrophe. 
And now, now it's come, it's come, it's become fashion again. You know, people, people, they have beautiful websites, and what they want to, they, what they show is mini incisions. Child, the child stays in the hospital overnight or goes home on the same day. They recover in no time, and and what the parents see is a good result because the the, the child goes into these techniques, into these surgeries with the knees bent or uh, walking on their toes, with the hips bent a little bit. And then next day they're all straight because the muscles were all stretched, but they were mm -hmm. all stretched a lot to get to that point. And the children, uh, get, they're better for a year, sometimes two years, but we see these children in the long term because they, then they come to us, and, uh, fortunately, but very uh, sometimes unfortunately because we can't rescue them. Uh, and what's happened is as you grow, the, and you don't have those muscles because the, those muscles have been over lengthened and you're heavier and you're taller and you need your muscles to walk, you slow down, you start having deformities, for instance, knees that go backwards, mm -hmm. you have the pelvis tilted forwards, huge lumbar lordosis, you know, that, that spine tilted forward because the, the hamstrings are no longer there. And unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it because the muscles are no longer there. And so we that's can't the rescue really them. Important. But, it's, but, it, but it's also a very difficult, it's, it's also a very difficult situation because the, the parents who love, who care, and they all do, and they all want to do the best for their kids. And I, I know that because I've seen these parents. Mm -hmm. they, they are, I call them all angels. In, in fact, when I have trainees next to me, I say, if you don't believe in angels, just stay in a day in a CP clinic with me and you'll, you'll find a lot. Because these kids are all super cool and these parents are super cool. They want to do the best. And because the kids got better initially, what they see five, 10 years down the track, we know that it's related to the surgery because that's what we've been studying all along. Yeah. But the parents cannot correlate that. And they will say, oh, this is natural history. And the, those doctors would say, this is natural history, okay? This is how the mm -hmm. kid is going to be anyway. But what we see is not, it's far from that. The, the, you know, the, the, the results that we have produced, and I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about a whole bunch of people in the world who follow, you know, these, these, these pathways, they produce long-term results that are sustained. And, and what I we think see, in fact, so is important. a lot of children that... It is so important because these people come to us as without their parents later. And, and then they say, okay, now um, I used to use, I used to walk independently. Now I had, then I had to use crutches and now my back is so tilted forwards. My pelvis is so tilted forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, I have so much back pain that I can't walk anymore. What can you do to help me? And you can't do anything because, because you can't do anything. There's no more muscles to, to, to help them anymore. And oh, I think that's why and it's, it's so pretty important sad. to and find and specialists, right? So it's really important, you know, if you're a parent out there to find specialists, not only in CP, but thinking about, you know, any sort of orthopedic surgery. Because what you're saying is, you know, orthopedic surgeries aren't reversible. It's not like if you cut a muscle that that muscle is going to you know, be able to be grown back and, you know, attached again in a different way and all those different things. Like these things are permanent. And so anything that you do, you need to think about the trajectory that it's going to have. And you need to find those uh, pieces. Because there is uh, obviously, if you know, you, you are an orthopedic surgeon, so you do do surgery. So there are definitely interventions that yeah. have been shown to work and work on those trajectories. But it's really important, you know, um, you know, I know that you've said something to me that really has always resonated with me. And that is the fact that, you know, as doctors, you share information and you, you all want to collaborate to do the best inter interventions. You don't hold on to it. So if there's only one person in the world doing something and, and the other uh, surgeons as a collective haven't taken that on board, there's probably a reason why. Oh, yeah. And it, there is a reason why every time. Because uh, and and that's exactly it. Unlike uh, any other profession, whenever we find something that works, 
and we can prove that it works in a scientific way, the first, one, the first thing a good doctor needs to do and wants to do is to share it. And other doctors will, will see it and think about it and perhaps repeat the experiment and, 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 uh, and say, yeah, this thing works. Whenever mm -hmm. somebody sees in medicine uh, that there's only one person doing a procedure or two, you have to be scared because think about it. If, I, if, if in medicine we share and I live, uh, I, I do medicine for two things. I, and I, I treat cerebral palsy for two reasons. Firstly, because it's my passion and I love it to be. And if I had to be born again 10 times, I would do the same thing. But secondly, because I need to pay my bills. I have two daughters, okay? So if someone is doing something better than me and my patients are all going to that person, what do I do? I go there and learn from this person because yeah. I want to keep the money the same way as any industry, okay? So why is it that certain treatments only happen, only take place in one, one spot or in another spot? Well, because we know, you know, people who understand this stuff and they want to sleep well every night and make sure that they didn't harm because that's the first thing, that's the first thing that we, uh, you know, we swear by when we become doctors is do no harm. Mm -hmm. it, 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 we know that that's, that's not good enough. Uh, and so I, that's what I try to, to teach my patients and families. Say, look, please go search on the internet. Now you can find cures for everything. Not really. Uh, but think about this. Think that when there's only one place doing one treatment, you need to be really, really careful. And I think because you know, there's something like we say in Aust like we say in Australia. I don't know if I can say it live, but in Australia we would say there's something dodgy there. Yeah, <laughs> or, no, or you say. So, so I think you know, and I think that's why you know, I think anyone watching, obviously, any resources that you see um, as part of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, anything that we put out there has been vetted by our Scientific Advisory Council, and we are so lucky to have you know, 20 of the best, you know, scientists and clinicians from around the world who, as you do, study this every single day. And, you know, they know all the latest things that are coming out because obviously there's always interventions that are happening and things are evolving and it's really important that obviously things continue to evolve. But, you know, you don't want to be, I suppose, the first person to do it. Now, we've got a couple of questions coming in, though, and I want to make sure that they get answered. So someone said, I had a tendon operation for my left leg okay. in 1983. Can my gait change on that? So I think they're probably Can my what? These, so they had a tendon operation in 1983. So, you know, I'm guessing they are an, an, an adult now. You know, can they see changes in gait happening now that were caused by that potential operation in 1983? Or, or you know, I think it adds to the question, as an adult, you may have already had some of these surgeries. You know, we've learned a lot over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how can they sort of come back in? Because I know you treat adults as well, which is super amazing. You know, it's like you, you see a child when they're born and you will see them until, you know, the last day. And so, you know, I think it's important that we touch base on what adults can do because we know there's limited information um, about adults, but it doesn't mean that there's not things that can help. Yes. I think there are certain patterns that we, we understand nowadays that are probably due to certain uh, surgeries. But uh, this person, uh, you know, in 1983, uh, and we need to be very careful with these things. In 1983, there, there was no gait analysis. Gait analysis was just mm -hmm. starting. People were starting to understand things. So whatever was done there, I'm sure was done in the best possible intention. The problem is that uh, the treatment of CP to start with came a little bit from uh, polio, you know, poliomyelitis. In polio, you get contracted muscles because the spinal cord is, is, um, is sick. And then uh, patients used to get lots of deformities and they couldn't do anything other than release the muscles or release the tendons or lengthening the tendons or very often transfer the tendons. When polio was taken care of by the vaccines, then came the big pool of cerebral palsy patients and people started thinking about cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some fantastic doctors there 
that uh, they it's amazing how much they knew already but they 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 borrowed a lot of the, the the procedures from polio treatments into cerebral palsy and cerebral palsy is a different disease altogether and and so over the years what we've learned is that when you lengthen muscles too much well you just think with me uh, uh, it's the muscles that move our skeleton it's mm -hmm. not uh, uh, the spirit ha helps but it's actually the muscles who which um, move us if you go there and you cut the muscles and you cut the muscles and you cut the muscles you may grow up very very straight but with no power because there's no muscles left so uh, that's why you know botulinum toxin came about selective doors of rhizotomy came about the more very conservative ways of lengthening muscles that we now know and, and these are not new techniques, but old techniques that had actually been abandoned in ma many years ago. And then gait analysis showed, no, these are actually the best techniques because mm -hmm. they're mild on the muscle. Therefore, the muscle doesn't lose a lot of power. So, and, and the other thing that gait analysis and, and Dr. Jim Gage, uh, you know, uh, uh, discovered is that it's not only about the muscles. You, how many people with cerebral palsy, you see them walking with the knees pointing in and the feet pointing out? Mm -hmm. And it's, so if you give those bones to any normal or typical muscle, the muscle will struggle. Now, if you have a muscle that is stubborn to start with and you don't have a very good selective motor control and you're, and you're weak and then your bones are all twisted one way or the other, it's not operating on the muscles that it's going to solve the problem. And that's what gait analysis taught us over the years. And Dr. G Jim Gage was, you know, the probably the most important uh, person in this field, yeah. explaining to the rest of the world, look, don't just lengthen muscles. We have to fix the bones as well. We have to fix the feet. But I learned it, and it was not it was not too difficult to learn. Unfortunately, I think what what keeps feeding this cycle is that the beautiful families who care and love their children, they get into a stage in, in their lives. And I wrote a little article about this, which is not scientific yet, but, but we're going to prove it right or wrong. Mm -hmm. I think they get to a phase that I call the phase three. Phase three is where families want uh, to cure the, their kids. And it's, it's, it's absolutely normal and, and beautiful to be in phase three because I have two girls. I know that if, 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 when they, they were sick in the past, I wanted to cure them. But there are people out there who know about phase three and they exploit phase three. They, mm -hmm. they exploit this, uh, this state of desperation. And, and that's when these kids are put through all these miraculous treatments out there. And that's when they they are you know harmed yeah many, well i think it goes back to very often to, to do no harm right and and i think do no harm isn't just doing no harm in the moment it's also doing no harm and what's going to happen long term and you know like we've touched on it quickly because we've also got somebody yeah. asking a question about you know obviously there's when we're talking about treatments there's lots of different treatment options and you've mentioned sort of SDR, you've mentioned multi-level surgery, you've mentioned some of those different things. Someone's asked, can you just talk a little bit more about SDR? Um, and do you use gait analysis before and after SDRs as well? Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, how could you tell anyone is better after SDR if you don't have a, 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 a gait analysis? If you're and anemic actually, before we go on with somebody that, somebody gives you blood, what, how much? Sorry, can you just describe what selective dorsal rhizotomy is for those that don't know? Because I'm just sort of thinking we're talking in acronyms. And, yeah. Um, so, uh, so as I was saying, how can you tell that you're better after a blood transfusion if you don't have a blood test? What if the blood transfusion wasn't enough? So, or, or made you sick because there's incompatibility or something else. So gait analysis just tells you whether you're better or worse, but it also tells you uh, or helps people tell whether you're a good candidate for rhizotomy. Rhizotomy is when the neurosurgeons go in the spinal cord and they, they, they check every one of the little nerve rootlets that are going into the muscles 
and they see the ones that are transmitting for, from the brain um, abnormal messages to the, to the muscles. And then what they do is they, they, they uh, basically uh, divide these, uh, these rootlets in mini, 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 mini rootlets and test them all. And then they trim, they clip the ones that are transmitting uh, uh, abnormal mm -hmm. messages to the muscles to try and decrease uh, spasticity. And pay attention that I'm saying decrease spasticity because I think if you decrease, I've seen children which had an overdose of rhizotomy and, and they were so weak uh, because mm -hmm. so many children rely on a little bit of spasticity to stand up and walk. So yeah. there's a dose for every treatment. Uh, so that's what rhizotomy does. So who, who is good for rhizotomy? Well, obviously those people who have a lot of spasticity because that's what rhizotomy treats. And, uh, and those people who are not too weak underlying mm -hmm. or uh, uh, under the, the spasticity. Those people that um, can, uh, can uh, be submitted to a long process of rehabilitation. So there's a lot of indications for rhizotomy. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and gait analysis not only helps us identify the good cases for rhizotomy, the ideal cases, and not so ideal, but still good. But it also uh, helps us, uh, when you do it uh, post rhizotomy, it helps us confirm that we've done the right thing. And, sure. uh, and also helps us to see if there's anything else that needs to be taken care of through orthopedic interventions, for instance. And, and I was gonna say, and helps, you know, devise that intervention plan. You know, I, my background is as a physical therapist and I did lots of sort of rehab um, for, children post selective dorsal rhizotomy and I know that we use gait analysis to help us work out you know what what were our goals what were we working on you know and I think that comes down to all of these conversations is that when you're looking at any type of intervention particularly interventions that are invasive you know you want to have as much information as possible so you want to be able to as you mentioned have yes. that window in before to work out exactly how you are right now you also potentially want to make sure that the interventions are doing what they say they do. You know, so, you know, you spoke about different levels. And yes. I think this is an interesting thing just to touch and on. And in the well. long term. Yeah. And, and you spoke on sort of different levels. And, and just with SDRs just then is that not all SDRs are the same because we're all different. And it's the same. Not all orthopedic surgery is the same. But what you don't want to do is go in blindly. Yeah. You don't want to go do something and not see what you're doing or not um, understand, more importantly, why you're doing something. And, and the other thing that it's important and very deliberately misleading, don't think that because you're getting a small incision in your skin, that's a very benign operation. And that's a very mm -hmm. minimally invasive operation because if the knife goes in there and cuts the whole of the muscle as I usually see these patients later down the track, they don't have the muscle anymore because the muscle is not attached anymore. Don't think this is minimally invasive. Don't, don't think, please, that this is a tiny little surgery because the damage that a tiny little surgery can make for mm -hmm. the rest of these kids' life is, is, uh, is uh, really important. And we've got one more question I that think, I want to make sure that we touch on before we go. Um, and so Emily, and Emily, thank you for your question. Emily has just asked, and I think it's in relation to selective dorsal rhizotomy, is that something for certain types of CP or explored for all types of CP? Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's a great question, Emily, and you're absolutely right. It's not for everyone. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's for, if, it's usually for the person who has spasticity. It's usually not very good in people who have dystonia. But you would be surprised with how many of my patients never heard about dystonia. And the minute they go into my uh, consulting room, I, I know that they have dystonia. Dystonia is when you can't, you can't fine tune your movements because there's a, a part right in the middle of your brain that doesn't control the fine tuning of your movements very well. Mm -hmm. And it's believed that... Uh, if you have spasticity, but if you have dystonia as well, uh, when you have a rhizotomy, the spasticity may go away, 
to a certain degree, but the dystonia tends to exacerbate. And dystonia is really hard to control. So, uh, so uh, yeah, rhizotomy, I know that there are centers around the world where all you have to do is to show up and you, you're going to get a rhizotomy. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and you're, even you as a parent may even get the rhizotomy yourself if you know how to, if you have the condition to pay. Everybody gets a rhizotomy, but it's not quite like that. And unfortunately, we see back. these kids as well down the track. Yeah, they always come back to us eventually because, and, and some of them do well because, you know, if you do the same thing a hundred times a day, eventually you will get one or two that are right. But yeah. we see a lot of them down the track, five, ten years down the track, who really are not doing well, and there isn't much we can do to help them, unfortunately. And so I think that, you know, I think if we're going to sort of reiterate some of the things today is obviously gait analysis gives you that, it's that tool that gives you the window into what, uh, what do you look like right now? What does your child look like right now? Um, what are the different intervention options that would be best to treat uh, you and thinking about right now, but also then thinking about what will be the long-term outcomes and what is then that trajectory um, that can be developed for an intervention plan. And as you said, sometimes that's doing nothing. Sometimes that is doing something a little bit, what would be perceived less invasive, like botulinum toxin. And then other times it's either, uh, you know, orthopedic surgery or potentially uh, something like an SDR as well. But you really, you know, it's not a one size fits all type uh, option. And, you know, really no. needing to work out and that's, to and, get this information. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think one of the things that happens in this area very often is that, and I heard it from, a, from an English professor many, many years ago, the, the fate of muscles is that they lie just under the skin. So mm -hmm. people just cut them. And, and, uh, but the truth is, I learned how to do total hip replacements when I was in training in Brazil between 1991 and 1990-94. Uh, you really, and since then, I think I've done one total hip replacement in my life. You don't mm -hmm. want to have your total hip replacement done by myself. You don't want to have your, your, your surgery done by what we call low volume surgeons, I think. And there yeah. are lots of low volume uh, CP surgeons. And I'm not saying that to criticize them because I, I, I think, I, I believe in people and I believe in, in people's aim and primarily in doctors that they want to help. But, but the truth is the same way I don't do total hip replacements in anyone because I don't know how to do them and I've never done them. Mm -hmm. I, I do CP surgery because that's, yeah. what I, that's what I'm trained for. So when you, when you go get uh, treatment for your children or yourselves, if you're gonna go to a, if you have a hip problem, then go to a hip surgeon. If yeah. you have, a, if you, have a, a, you know, a skin problem, go to a dermatologist that has seen that. If you have CP, go to a doctor who understands about CP or uh, even though I think after 25 years of treating CP mm -hmm. every day, I know less today than I knew uh, in the first year, but yep. you know, s search for someone who has experience in, the, in that area. I think that's such incredible advice and particularly for adults, right? Because I think, you know, for a lot of children and for families, they're potentially in CP clinics and those CP clinics go up to the age of 18. But you know, for adults, sometimes they say you've got to now transition out into adult services. Now, you're, this is really important to still find doctors who have that understanding of cerebral palsy because you're, the outcomes, you need to make sure that they understand what they can be rather than just saying, all right, we're going to treat uh, the same as what we would do every other time, which, you know, as you said, disease states and yes. different disabilities are very different. So, you know, it's really important. And so I think in that way, I just want to sort of, you know, obviously point out to everyone again that, um, you know, the Weinberg Family Cerebral Palsy Centre, there is also a few other centres around the country who really focus on adults and focus actually across the whole lifespan. And so if you're um, looking at doing any of these different surgeries, if you're looking at doing an intervention, you know, please reach out um, 
to either, uh, you know, some someone like the someone like Dr. Selba, or you know, reach out to the foundation. We're happy to try to connect you with uh, locations around the country where you can sort of get some of this advice that you can trust. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, we know that uh, living with a, a disability is, is, is tough and it's hard, uh, but it's, it's, it's a cool life. And I, and, mm -hmm. and I think what we our, our duty here at the Weinberg Center is to make it as easy as possible uh, for these patients. So what the Weinberg Center is trying to, uh, to compose, it's, and it's doing a terrific job is to gather all sources of resources so that when patients come here we don't even use the name transition anymore i never liked the name transition because i i know that when kids go to another hospital the other hospital doesn't even know them very well and and it's mm -hmm. like a big big breakage in the, in the process here uh, what we're trying to do thanks to dr david roy's uh, vision is to not transition. You you will be stuck with us, and we'll be <laughs> stuck with you uh, throughout life. And we'll do all we can to to help you and assist and and you know walk the pathway together. But really walk the pathway together, and not yeah. just you know transition you to someone else. No, and I think that's so important. But. Thank you. I know that we've sort of spent a lot of your time today and just so thankful for how much time that you've given us because I know you're obviously pleasure. a very, very busy man. But um, that was such a wonderful conversation. And for everybody, just so you know, we'll be posting all the different um, resources around gait analysis and obviously how you can get in contact with um, Dr. Selva. But thank you so much and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And thank we'll you. be seeing you next Tuesday. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.